So, uh, welcome everyone. This is actually Queer Perspectives on Law 3, being the third event we've done in the series over a number of years. Um, I'm really uh, excited to have another uh, event on the topic today. So, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Gina Heathcote, Chair of the Centre for Gender Studies here at SOAS. Um, so I'll be discussing today, and it's a real pleasure to um, welcome uh, three colleagues uh, from SOAS, also members of the Centre for Gender Studies, uh, all three of them really quite engaged in both the research events and in supporting the centre in lots of different ways. Uh, so really uh, lovely to be able to host an event uh, with the three of them. So I don't have bios because I wasn't originally the chair. So if you need their bios, you have to look them up. But I can tell you a little bit about each of them. We've got three papers. Um, actually, before I tell you about those, I want to tell you about the two previous events. So we had an, uh, actually had a conference on queer perspectives on law that IL ran with uh, Di Otto. Well, how many years ago was it? Uh, was it 2014? No. It's 13 maybe. Anyway, it was, it was a big conference, a day-long conference, fantastic, and it was a real sense at the end of it that we wanted to do more around this and continue it. Um, uh, and I guess in some ways... Well, if you were part of it. I, we well, were all, we all participated in different ways. I think I even gave a paper, you a paper. actually. A, a long lost pa paper on the retrosexuality of international law, which I should dig out and rewrite one day. Um, and um, it's waiting in the wings. Uh, and I think there was a sense that there was more that we wanted to do around the topic. Um, and in some ways, there have been different things that we've done in the centre. Certainly, setting up an MA in gender and sexuality uh, has been something that I'm you know, personally very proud of and something that I hope that will continue to grow as part of the centre's work. Um, and then last year, was it last year or the year before? I was getting really old. We had a fantastic second event uh, where we invited uh, Professor Alex Sharp to come speak on her work on gender fraud and gender identity. It's a fantastic uh, seminar as well. So this is the third in a kind of long-ranging seminar, a series of discussions. And of course, it also is in response to an event held at, held at Melbourne University on queer law in December, where I think uh, each of these papers was presented and I was realised there's a kind of dissonance, uh, not dissonance, uh, a, a kind of coming together of themes that was really important in these three papers that we wanted to bring back to SOAS uh, and have, give you all an opportunity to engage with. So the first paper, titled Gay Governance, a Queer Critique, is presented by my colleague, uh, Professor I.L. Gross, who works here in the School of Law um, and also at Tel Aviv University. Um, the second paper, International Law as Violence, Competing Absences of the Other, by my colleague Vanya Hansik, also at the School of Law here at SOAS. And the third paper, uh, just titled Atonement, uh, by Dr. Rahul Rao, who is uh, in the Politics and International Studies uh, Department here at SOAS. But as I said, all of them are active members of the centre, so I think we should put that next to your bios and names as well. So I'm going to invite Ayal to start us off uh, with his paper. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> Thanks to the Center for Gender Studies and to the Center of International Law, Colonialism, and something I forgot. Thanks, Aya. Who <laughs> is, uh, 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 is a law school uh, partner, and here is uh, Katriana here. Um, so, uh, and yeah, and I'm happy that, uh, it's, uh, as, as, as Gina said, we started uh, and then. Uh, uh, did the second one where Alex and I presented on gender vaccination, now the third one. And, and as Gina said, actually, the three of us uh, found ourselves in the same panel in Melbourne and said, so actually, it's kind of funny that the three of us present are together in a panel in Melbourne discovering our papers really need to connect. We should present it in SOS rather than just down under. So uh, here we are. Um, so, um, so uh, my, my paper uh, is. Uh, a, 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 it looks at, uh, at the con what I call gay governance, which is really, in a way, uh, uh, kind of a response, a continuation of, of uh, the idea called governance feminism, which some of you may have heard, which has been quite a lot of interest following the work of a few scholars, uh, um, especially Janet Haley, Hila Shamir, Prabha Kuti Soran, and Rachel Rabuche, wrote about those places where ideas coming from feminism become incorporated into the state. And, and gain some power through the state and have effect. Um, 
and, uh, and actually this paper started when they asked me uh, as part of their project on governance feminism to write to say what, what can you tell us about it from uh, an LGBT perspective and then I, I thought about this idea of, of you know of gay, gay, gay governance which brings together a lot of things that many of us have been thinking and talking about but I try to bring together a few levels uh, where this is occurring so and, and I think all of them have to do with this change that has been talked about quite a lot um, uh, in some kind, change happening in some countries, and we have to emphasize, of course, only in some countries, from the depiction of the homosexual as a threat to the nation, which was very much manifest, for example, in the debates in, ha happening in many countries about uh, the, what's called the gays in the military question. Uh, so, right, right, is it a threat to the security of the nation? So, from, from this depiction of the homosexual as a threat to the nation, to a notion of homosexuals as embedded in the nation, and, 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 and part of it, and also part of what serves to brand it both internally and externally and, and liberal and democratic. And part of this process has been captured in a uh, discussion of homo nationalism. Last year we had Raoul organize a symposium with Jasper Poir, who, uh, who wrote uh, uh, famously about homo nationalism, um, and which continued uh, the work of Lisa Dagen on homo normativity. Um, and, uh, Whereas Dagen talked about homonormativity, where frameworks, uh, uh, the framework of where what you call domesticated gay, uh, gay um, uh, and then um, uh, which you know the kind of homosexual <coughs> parallel of heteronormativity, and then uh, Poir talked about national homonormativity, which is a homonationalism, and a lot of it was also captured in the debate about pink washing, the use by states, and a lot of this talk is about Israel, but. It's not ex exclusive to Israel. They talk about um, the use of LGBT rights for uh, public di diplomacy and propaganda purposes. Uh, uh, and this has to do with the way right, that homosexuality serves as a mark of liberalism, of democracy, or at least is attempt, the attempts made to, to, uh, to have it play this role. So uh, what I want to do now is, is, is to talk about, uh, uh, to continue this debate by talking about gay governance occurring in a few levels, national, municipal, and global. So you know, if we are talking about homo nationalism, maybe we can also talk about homo, homo globalism and homo municipalism. And, and through that, to bring up some of the questions that come up when this happens to homosexuality, it gets embedded within the state, and we see this gay governance. So I'm going to, to really bring a few examples, talk about the debates it generated, and then uh, talk, try and, 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 and draw some conclusions, or temporary conclusions. Uh, so, uh, so very famously, the debate about homonationalism and pinkwashing, a lot of it occurred in, in the context of Israel. And uh, this is uh, just one poster from uh, a PR agency. And I think it's a poster that's really good for discussion because it brings together almost all the same, right? Uh, Homonormativity, so the gay people who are very normative, they serve in the army like everyone, the homonationalism and the pinkwashing, the use of the gay rights for propaganda, and here especially, you know, in, in this almost ironic sense, because the military is the one that is executing many violations of human rights, especially in the context of the uh, occupied Palestinian territory, and, and here it's used to actually Right, rally us to support Israel because of the fact that gay people can serve openly in the army, made it to democracy. Um, so I think a lot of been talked. This topic was discussed quite a lot, and, uh, and, uh, and of course we can bring many examples to that. Uh, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, almost every speech he gives at the UN General Assembly, talks about gay rights in Israel, especially when he wants to, for example, attack Iran, and he said he runs a hang gay in Israel with gay pride parade. So this is the proof of. Uh, right, that you should support us. And after the Gaza flotilla uh, incident, where Israeli army intercepted the boats aiming to break the Gaza siege, killing nine people, Netanyahu says, "Why do human rights activists come to us? Go to the places where they oppress women. Go to the places where they hang homosexuals in town squares. Go to where there is no freedom of expression." <coughs> so again, this use of gay rights and other issues like women's rights. Uh, and supposedly the mark of liberal, liberalism, and he says anyone who wants human rights are truly important needs to support liberal democratic Israel. Now, um, uh, we can talk about the appropriation of uh, developments in LGBT rights that occurred within Israel by the state. Uh, I have another paper which has been published, you can all read it, 
uh, about specific about this process and about also what is the role of the LGBT communities, what conflict it causes within the LGBT community. So I'm not going to go into this uh, debate in detail. Uh, but I think that I, so I want to move a little bit more from the national level to the to the local level to this homo municipalism. <coughs> and uh, this was a hang in uh, City Hall in Tel Aviv just before Gay Pride of 2012. Outside City Hall, this is a big poster for uh, for Gay Pride. I mean, there were a few posters with different, I, to be honest, with more diverse images. But this was the main one. And of course, again, it shows the homo activity. Uh, uh, there's a little play with the flags because you can't see it here, but there's a little slogan that refers to a famous song about flags which is sung in Israel Independence Day. So again, you see the normativity you know, of the, you know, uh, of uh, the whole normativity of the gays as that, you know, having this uh, kind of uh, nuclear family structure and the national nationalism, etc. But here it already plays more like of a domestic role. And here we see that, uh, for example, the, the city plays a big role in it by, for example, in Tel Aviv, the city for quite a few years now is a main producer of gay pride. It becomes an event which the city produces. And this is also the LGBT community center in Tel Aviv, which uh, was actually funded by the city. And actually, it's run, belongs to the city. So most LGBT community rights groups are there, but actually it belongs to the city. Now, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, last from this series, this is a picture that I actually took in the Gay Beach in Tel Aviv. Uh, and around Gay Pride, uh, the city puts up uh, music on the beach, and you see this flag. Once again, if you want you know, images for homo nationalism, you see the nice rainbow flag with the Israeli flag combined, etc. Now, all those developments cause a lot of questions, and, 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 and especially, uh, 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 so you, you, you ask what happens when, um, for example, this, this gay beach is, uh, the reason it's, it's a gay beach because it's under the park that used to be the central cruising area for gay people in Israel in the past. Um, and then in a few years back, they did all sorts of renovations in this park, and some people said that those renovations are destroying what was a major <coughs> cruising area where gay people were sat. And then they approached uh, a member of Tel Aviv Council of the city who is, uh, who is gay and is also the mayor's legend for gay rights. And, and they asked him, you should, you, know, you should do something about it. And he said, no, this is a matter, you know, we shouldn't, uh, that's a matter of the past when gay people live in the closet. Today we don't have to support, uh, you know, uh, those parks, which are gay cruising area, etc. So you, so you see this also the question about this gay governance and what happens when it is appropriated or allows itself to be appropriated into a very homonormative understanding uh, of sexuality, uh, which here you know goes together with the homo nationalism, and there are a lot of uh, the, the whole gay beach saying you know the city investing it is also part of a gay tourism campaign, which some people argue is part of the pink washing, you know, to bring tourists to Israel to see how it is great on gay rights. So all of those things are, are happening, and now we uh, and, 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 and and bring up a lot of questions. Um, uh, we can also ask about what exactly does homo normativity mean here, because on one hand. Uh, uh, you know, the park maybe doesn't fulfill its historical role, but the people who come here to the to the beach and then go to the clubs, which do uh, which take uh, uh, you know which take place around Gay Pride, uh, 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 you know, it's it's uh, uh, there's some maybe tension between different understanding of what exactly is here as a normativity. Because on one hand, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I can tell you there are pretty good parties which can go all night, uh, you know, during Pride, but not only during Pride a bit. And you know, if you go to them and maybe have uh, sex in the club or have drugs or whatever, you know, you can't exactly wake up in time to go to the army or raise those children and take them to school, right? So, what exactly is homonormativity here? Because uh, uh, Hagen talked about uh, homonormativity as being domesticity and consumption, but those don't always go together, right? There's domesticity and there's some kind of consumption which won't go together. Now, so that's uh, the municipal level connected to the national level. And, and it brings up a lot of questions because, uh, by the way, you know, I, uh, for example, I don't think it's a bad thing that you know the city pays for the LGBT rights center and that allows today to the clinic there and people can get free HIV tests and, and you can find social workers which work with gay teens. So I'm very, you know, I, I, I'm very careful, very active discourse. Oh, the city runs it, so it's all like, you know, just this bad thing. You know, it's much more complex than that, right? Because, you know, we want those money, this money, a lot of good things is done with it. Uh, but then, on the other hand, you know, then there can be an argument about programming. Some officials, which pay, get the salary from the city, can affect programming. Not that there has been a lot, you know, 
serious censorship, but some people have complained about certain things. Okay, so now let's move to uh, another uh, national level, and this is uh, um, another example, which is hate crime law. This was especially discussed in the U.S., but in other countries too. Uh, so there's a famous law called the Matthew Shepard Act, which uh, Matthew Shepard and James Beard Hate Crime Prevention Act, which um, uh, um, held uh, in the U.S. Uh, that uh, you know hate crimes based on uh, sexual orientation uh, would and gender identity would be considered a federal hate crime. And a lot of, again, great, great rights advocates uh, supported this and found this like uh, the big victory, but some people criticized it. So this is from the group called the Nancy Quality, and they say queers de demand the world without prisons. So some, while well, some gay groups supported it, other groups um, say that actually uh, hate crime legislation is a, uh, 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 rather than drastic systems of violence, uh, it actually uh, it aims to put more people in, in prison. Um, uh, our colleague from Berg, Bexar Lambert, called it queer invested in punishment. So, do we want to support, from a queer perspective, putting more people in jail for longer terms, uh, even if they do horrible things, and especially given who are the people most likely to find themselves in prison, usually poor people, people of color. So, we see here, this is, I think, a hate crime law is a great example of the gay government succeeding, a law is legislated to support the gay rights cause. But the question that, as you see, I want to ask all the time, are what are the prices and who pays them? Um, so, uh, and now, now let's move to the UK. Uh, so, uh, David Cameron said a few years ago, I don't support gay marriage despite being conservative, I support gay marriage because I'm conservative. Now, we can talk a lot about same sex marriage and its own role as, as, uh, in uh, gay governance and its effect on uh, whether it, it reinforces the prioritization of certain kind of relations against a nuclear family. Of course, on the other hand, it does generate equality for people. On the other hand, you know, for whom and for whom not. Those are very big questions. And again, I'm putting them aside for a moment because the debate about same-sex marriage could be an interesting paper by its own. But, uh, but after that, uh, after same-sex marriage was legislated, Cameron said, uh, that you want to export gay marriage to the entire world as part of the global race where the UK should export more and sell more. Which is, you know, I had to check five times that he really said, right? <laughs> so it becomes like a commodity that the UK has to sell in the global race. And then um, uh, we see this, uh, <coughs> this idea that we take our gay rights when we finally achieve them and we want to market them globally. And this is done in a few ways. How am I doing with the time? Who took okay. it? Okay. Okay, okay, I'll take it two hours. Okay, uh, this is, so this is, a, a, I have to, you know, the, the whole, next, next thing is homophobic, so I apologize, but uh, it, uh, I'll explain in the background to it. So then, actually, Cameron also came up with this idea, and he said that countries that ban homosexuality may lose aid payments unless they reform, because we want to attach more strings to British aid. So, uh, so I think, Rahul, I think you would call it gay conditionality first, as far as I know, uh, right? Uh, so I think Rahul will talk about it too, I think. Uh, this gay conditionality, this idea that we should condition A based on uh, whether you support gay rights or not. And, uh, and this produced this horrible homophobic uh, caricature in, I forgot now uh, which country, but I had it written somewhere, well, I think Nigeria. Uh, so um, now, but I'm showing this, because there has been a lot of arguments, there has been a lot of backlash to that. And especially with same-sex marriage, and with some African countries saying, okay, so now because the UK has same-sex marriage, we all have to do same-sex marriage. And then when gay people fight even for very basic rights, like not to be imprisoned because of having uh, same-sex sex, uh, uh, suddenly they are faced with the fact that the UK came and said, we're going to export gay marriage. And when the UK talks about conditionality, they say, well, okay, they're going to deny our funding if we don't support gay marriage. So the backlash against gay people in those countries, some people argue, is become bigger. And that has been causing a lot of controversy, and we'll talk about that soon. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the gay conditionality took uh, the real form. A few cases, one of the famous one is that in 2014, when the World Bank announced that because of the anti-gay law, it would indefinitely delay 90 million US dollars health care loan to Uganda. Now the money in question was earmarked for the struggle against maternal mortality, which rate in Uganda is very high. And given the prevalence of HIV in Uganda, the result of this denial could be daunting. And this is, it doesn't have to do specifically with the, with the conditionality, this is just general thing to remind us about 
uh, about uh, maternal mortality in Uganda. Now, so here we say in the name of gay rights, we take out money which is supposed to protect women's rights and, and, and right to health, which, so we see the prices, and, and, and the question is, you know, why should they have to pay the price? But we see the gay governance against the price. So the gay rights idea becoming part of government, and now on the global level, because it's not only anymore uh, the national level of sex-sex marriage in the UK, we want to export sex-sex marriage. The international institutions also adopt the idea of gay rights, write the word back, and they say we're going to cut money to Uganda. Um, now, uh, some people say, by the way, that the fact that after the, you know, the Uganda uh, uh, court struck down the law that uh, uh, Raul can talk more about it, he knows more about it than me, but it struck down the law uh, against, I mean, the, you know, there is already a law, right, but the newer, more extreme law. It struck it down on procedural grounds, and some people think that, you know, uh, Uganda <laughs> government is not going to, to move to re-legislate it because of international pressure. So we can say maybe it succeeded, but then at, at whose price? Uh, and, 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 and is there another way to do it? Again, as I said, I had many questions. I don't really have uh, all the answers today. And, uh, but, uh, um, uh, uh, now, there has been a lot of opposition uh, and, and, uh, you know, uh, from a human rights group, including some LGBT activists in Uganda, against this and said, uh, and, and, you know, and they said, uh, you know, uh, you shouldn't be doing uh, those things. For example, they said the imposition of dollar sanctions may be one way of seeking to improve the human rights situation <coughs> in a country, but does not in of itself result in the improved protection of the rights of LGBTI people. Donor sanctions are by their nature coercive and reinforce the disproportionate power dynamics between donor countries and recipients. They are often based on assumptions about African sexualities and the needs of African and LGBTI people. They disregard the agency of African civil society movement and political leadership. They also tend to exaggerate the environment of intolerance in which political leadership scapegoat LGBTI people for donor sanction in an attempt to return and reinforce national state sovereignty. Now, uh, after the Cameron said, I can't say from here. Oh, okay, after Cameron said what he said, uh, US State Department under Hillary Clinton, maybe the next president of the US, uh, uh, came out with its own statement about how gay rights are going to be part of uh, uh, US policy. <coughs> and so, uh, in 2011, Hillary Clinton addressed the need for global consensus on the recognition of human rights of LGBT people, and she said the Obama administration, as being uh, while being Secretary of State, she said the Obama administration defends human rights of LGBT people as part of her comprehensive human rights policy and as a priority of our foreign policy. And the U.S. diplomats will raise issues about the LGBT rights globally, etc. Now. Um, uh, we can uh, maybe distinguish because the U.S. did not talk about conditionality as such, although there was at least one case of U.S. aid cut to Uganda or suspended related to that topic. Uh, and, uh, I don't have the time to it, but uh, you know, some people have written uh, comparing the discourse of uh, Cameron and of Hillary Clinton and showing that you know maybe the, the American discourse was less imperialist in this case, less uh, offensive, etc. Um, and, uh, but, we, uh, but, uh, but again, the question of comes up. Uh, this is not related, but uh, gay rights, human rights, uh, was before Hillary released it, Dana International Israel, it's one gender singer, posted from 1999. So I just see gay rights, human rights, I love this poster, so I have to show it to you. But then, um, uh, uh, following that, the US appointed a special representative by the State Department for LGBT rights, is Mr. Randy Berry. Like the picture in the beach, that's also a picture I took because he, I happy to be invited to a reception with him with the U.S. Embassy in Israel, and uh, here his vision, and uh, and it's very interesting. We can talk more. I can tell you more about what he told me later if you want to. But basically, uh, his appointment. Some people said it's great. It's great that America are now helping us, and some people said this will create more backlash. And people, for example, people are asking why single out gay rights. So are there like. Are they making them what are always being accused that special rights that the U.S. State Department has a special representative for them, where it may not have for other issues? The question of backlash has been addressed recently. <coughs> this is December, uh, December the, uh, 2015. New York Times was a big story. U.S. support of gay rights in Africa made that more hard than good, and uh, so actually it made it to the mainstream press. This question of the backlash, etc. So to conclude, uh, the editor of the book on the gay movement and state pointed out the fact that homosexual claims 
are increasingly institutionalized as administrators and ministers in charge of LGBT equality are spreading in different parts of the world, and as a lesbian and gay demands are also being articulated in international and supranational arenas. I did talk about the gay rights in the UN, that's another story. But at the same time, as maybe as a backlash, more standardly hostile reactions could be emerging, which would also confirm the increased salience of these issues. The examples I discussed are but a few of many examples that could be discussed and come to the complex consequences of the shift in the status of homosexuality from a social phenomenon suffering persecution, or at least marginalization by the state, to one which is part of the state, the municipality, or global governance. When gay activists support legislation that may lead to get greater um, uh, imprisonment, support the gentrification of cruising, or participate in actions the states may use as propaganda. When same-sex marriage becomes an export commodity that could increase the persecution of people who practice same-sex relationship in the global south, and when gay conditionality emerges, we may talk of gay governance. Arguably, any demand for rights engages the state, and is thus open to the appropriation discussed here. Thus, in assessing the processes described here, a careful analysis is needed. Gay governance, we have to admit, sometimes may be do good, may be do good if it is part of empowering people, reducing persecution, increasing equality and freedom, but it comes at the cost and may do harm if it prioritizes gay rights over other rights. If promoting gay rights comes at the expense of Palestinian rights, or of health rights in Uganda, or causes more imprisonment in a way that deepens the oppression of racial minorities and poor people. I hope I've shown that gay governance occurs not only at the state level, but also at the municipal level on one hand, and at the global level on the other hand, both in the context of the UN human rights mechanism, which I didn't address, and that of international financial institutions. And I have to say, in the UN, it's very rudimentary, it's getting a lot of backlash, it hasn't been a huge success yet. And uh, now, a queer critique of gay governance, shifting the discussion from the protection of a certain identity to question of opposing hierarchies and structure of power around sexuality as well as other axes, may consider who benefits and who loses from gay governance. And, 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 uh, and consider how gay governance and the struggle for gay rights may be part of the solution, but also part of the problem, maybe leading us to rethink uh, you know, what uh, routes should the struggle for LGBT equality take. Okay, thank you. Research primarily revolves around human subjectivity formation and insurrectional, insurrectionary vernacular. He likes to use big words a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is particularly interested in various Islamic legal traditions and their intersections with gender diversity, as well as uh, Marxist social, political, and economic thought and legal theory as well. Um, uh, Banya's authored books have just come out um, um, in the last few months include sexual and gender diversity in the Muslim world, history, law, and vernacular knowledge. And also, um, in 2010, control and sexuality, the revival of Zina laws in Muslim contexts. And the title of this talk is International Law as Violence, Competing Absences of the Other. Thank you, Peter, for introducing me yet again. And uh, thank you all for coming. And my special thanks, of course, to the Zina and to Tree and to those centers that they so wonderfully lead uh, for bringing us all together here. It is my utmost pleasure to be with this great group of people and to discuss something that I found very difficult and I find in many ways problematic to discuss and I hope that the discussion then can take various turns to say the least. Uh, what I'll be talking about primarily is the relationship between law and violence and indeed of law as violence and what can be gained if law is no longer constituted as part of this couplet of law and violence, but rather as violence itself. And I will revert to a bit old-fashioned reading of my paper, so I'm sorry for that. I won't read all of it, but I'll read most of it, and I hope that we can then engage in more dynamic dialogue afterwards. So 
Law and violence are an old couple in analytical forays, as you all know, in their affairs. They produce the welter of disparate diagnoses, most of which, however, agree that they, this relationship is an unhealthy but necessary fact of life. As with children in abusive families, we are cautioned that any alternative to enduring this relationship in our lives would be catastrophic and that we better shape up for a long journey ahead and indeed better understand, as the song says, that all this is for our own good. For instance, in Law's Violence, uh, Austin Sarratt and Thomas Keynes uh, conclude that violence is a fact and a metaphor, is integral to the constitution of modern law, and that law is a creature of both literal violence and of imaginings and threats of force, disorder, and pain. Without either literal or abstract violence, we are told there can be no law. But law is, or rather ought to be, because it also holds a promise that it can contain and control the violence it deems brute and excessive, the very violence of the world outside law. The imperfection imminent to law's violence taming of extra-legal violence is law's driving force, an anomaly built into the system to ensure its preservation. For Sarat and Kirins, uh, violence stands as the limit of law, as a reminder of both law's continuing necessity and its ever-present failing. Without violence, law is unnecessary, yet in its presence, law may be impossible. The couplet of law and violence is thus forever entangled in a double bind, a distressing existential drama that both threatens and makes this relationship possible. But although apparently interdependent, law and violence are not in an equal relationship, whether it is described as a product of social and economic relations or more alarmingly, as some studies say, as biologically predetermined, as almost inherent heritage in humans and other animals, <coughs> violence is thought to predate law and exist both within and without law's life worlds. In contrast, law is constituted by violence because violence provides the occasion and method for founding legal orders. It gives law as the regulator of force and coercion a reason for being, and it provides a means through which the law acts. This etiological connection is, however, typically denied by law and contrasted with laws seemingly nobler originative myths, such as those of justice, peace, and security, which are also projected as law's ultimate ends. It is non-violence, then, in which law claims to inhere and in which it wants to exist, except that, as ever, law's claims are deceptive. Samir Asmir uh, famously has demonstrated in her analysis of the recent wars in Iraq how laws, operations of global peace, security, and non-violence are themselves productive of their own violence, and how wars can be carried out for the law. Thus, the violence of non-violence mediated through law reaffirms law's subordinate relationship with violence, a relationship in which violence is not only law's raison d'être, but its magistra vita too, the ultimate heuristic device for contemplating law's past, present, and future. International law is particularly notorious for its continuous evolution towards ever more diverse forms of juridical violence. From the falsehood of imperial pacifism that characterized the early 20th century efforts to juridify war, through the perils of the multiple turns to pragmatism and quasi-proportionality with regards to the legally sanctioned uses of force, to the infinitude of contemporary warfare, international law's spectacles of violence seem to proliferate at an unprecedented pace. Is it then too preposterous to ask what insights could be obtained if international law is posited no longer as a discipline and practice intrinsically committed to regulation of violence, but as violence itself? If it is presumed that all law is violence, then the time-honored analytical diet of law and violence no longer makes sense. Law's violence becomes the very essence of law, and law's violence against both literal and abstract forms of extra-legal violence can be seen as law's intrinsic survival strategy, something law does in order to be, in order to distinguish itself from an otherwise indistinguishable multitude of violent acts. Law's difference from such acts is then merely circumstantial and contingent, owing to particular societal conditions that rule over it, rather than vice versa, thus exposing the fallacy of the rule of law. Such law is not exceptional, not worth preserving at any cost. It can and perhaps should, as many Marxist analysis have said, wither away. If all law is violence, then international law is perfectly suited for global violent pursuits. 
It is well entrenched and institutionalized and it provides multiple fora of engagement. Each violent in its own right and respect to a specific set of conditions that govern or purport to govern human lives and relations. This intervention considers one such forum, the United Nations Security Council, which has evolved over time into perhaps the most potent symbol of legally sanctioned state violence in international relations, not least because of its botched attempts to curb wars and punish uh, war crimes. The, the Council is also, as Diana also averse, deep seat of power of the world's superpowers, whose permanent members are also the world's, as you know, largest arms dealers. Initially envisaged as pursuing military actions in its own right, instead of merely advising states on such matters, and even having armed forces continuously available to it, the Council has gradually moved towards juridical rather than literal forms of violence. Those are epitomized in the establishment of its ad hoc war crimes tribunals, which followed Yugoslav and Rwandan conflicts in the 1990s, and <coughs> subsequently in its resolutions on counterterrorism. The oxymoronic formula that the Council has relied on in these operations, such as its insistence on international legal enforcement of global peace, justice, and security, reveal all too plainly the violent nature of such purportedly non-violent acts. Or, as Derrida suggests, the word enforceability reminds us that there is no such thing as law that doesn't imply in itself, a priori, the possibility of being enforced, applied by force. The Council's repeated vows to kill insecurity for security and to defeat violence for peace should therefore be understood literally as acts of juridical aggression as international laws on war on war. The discussion on the intrinsic violence of the Council's dealings in international law, which in turn reveals the intrinsic violence of international law, is framed in this intervention of mine in relation to a single recent event, the first so-called ever Security Council meeting on the persecution of, uh, as I quote, LGBT Syrians and Iraqis by the so-called Islamic State, or ISIS which took place on the 24th of August 2015. I argued that whilst dealing with, but also perpetrating and perpetuating multiple forms of violence, this event at the same time reveals some productive voids, especially with regard to the dominant framing of the subjectivities and subjects of the international legal discourse and intervention. Such voids, I propose, allow for theorizing the absence of international law and in turn the absence of the subject of juridical violence. So, in this intervention, I revisit first uh, certain loci classica of critical theories, discussions on violence, so as to assess their relevance for my premise that all law is violence. And then I inquire in particular whether the diverse categories of violence, as devised by critical theorists, make sense in international law's life works, and if not, what is to be done? In turn, I turn then to international law's intrinsic violence as a spouse in the Security Council's engagement with ISIS that newly begotten hostis humani genius, as well as with ISIS's potential perfect authority in the image of LGBT Syrians and Iraqis. I conclude that this conceptual meeting of two unlikely actants or personalities of international law, one deemed quintessentially evil and the other just as good, is not an ordinary event. Rather, it probes the very foundations of laws, violence and signals and existential crisis amidst the global operations of international law, thus revealing an illegal space for critique and contemplation or simply for a life imagined beyond law. Out of an array of critical re-engagements on the left uh, with violence as a social phenomenon, two analytical encounters are almost proverbial nowadays for the in-depth and, you know, and the number of productive responses that they were able to, to elicit. The first is, as you all probably know, Walter Benjamin's notoriously dense critique of violence, published in 1921. Second is Jean Paul Sartre's controversial preface to the 1961 edition of Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Both texts uh, have proven difficult to render into English, not least because the words Recht and Trois in German and French respectively denote both law and right. And a, ta a trait, as you know, that is shared across many Germanic, Romanesque and Slavic languages. While the German word give out means not only violence, but also, as the Heda carefully notes, legitimate power or authority of the force. The failures and misfortunes of translation, taken as a linguistic, philosophical, and cultural labor, thus befall in particular Benjamin's text. 
At the same time, Benjamin's text has been described as at once mystical and hypercritical, a text which in certain respects can be read as neo-messianic Jewish mysticism grafted onto post-Sorelian neo-Marxism. That's what Derrida famously claims in his uh, take on this text. It might be this Beneminian mystical critique that propelled Slava Zizek to compose his 2008 book on violence out of six sideways glances rather than confronting violence directly. In so doing, Zizek is careful not to succumb to the mystique of violence itself. My underlying premise, he writes, is that there is something inherently mystifying in a direct confrontation with violence, the overpowering horror of violent acts and an empathy with the victims inexorably function as a lure which prevents us from thinking. The same perhaps could be said for the lure of law, with the now lure echoing uncannily the world rule in its messianic mode, the law that solemnly results that justice be done. Benjamin's approach to the lure of both law and violence is to bring these terms of art, that is, law as a best and violence as kebabs, into a symbiotic relationship in which their interdependence becomes the key for their dialectical difference as well as their metaphysical unity. This symbiosis is achieved through a series of distinctions. Benjamin distinguishes, for example, between law-making violence and law-preserving violence to account for two different ways in which violence is memorialized and built into the legal system, and crucially, to move beyond the impasse contained in the distinction between natural and positive law. Among all, all the forms of violence permitted by both natural law and positive law, Benjamin suggests, there is not one that, there, that is free of the gravely problematic nature of all legal violence. To explain this nature, he erects yet another pair of oppositions, that of mythic violence, or mystische Gewalt, and divine violence, or göttliche Gewalt. The former denoting the very lure of law, its mystifying powers to keep us forever entrapped in its vicious circle, while the latter suggests a path to liberation from that circle. Divine violence, in that sense, is quite literally a deus ex machina, a type of violence, such as the proletarian general strike, that sets itself the sole task of destroying state power, which will ultimately open again all the internal forms, as he claims. So Benjamin's divine violence is thus revolutionary in that it serves no means other than that of liberating us from the intrinsic injustice of law. It reminds us of the possibility of a life outside law and juridical violence. While a lawless life for Benjamin is a possibility, it is not a life without violence, of course. Whether divine violence is conceived as a temporary occurrence or indeed a road to a new form of sovereignty, it can only set us free from, the, from one pervasive form of violence, that of law as such. Absent of revolution, even that is but a distant dream. So, what's to be done? Sartre's answer in his preface to Finance the Wretched of the Earth seemed to be to embrace, even celebrate, the insurgent violence of the oppressed, since such violence, like Achilles' spear, can heal the wounds it has inflicted, as he famously writes. Sartre's call to arms, then, as it were, were primarily, was primarily intended to wake the Europeans to third world decolonial struggle. Still, the would-be self-soothing properties of violence, in his reference to Achilles' spear, elicited a barrage of criticism. For instance, in her essay on violence, Hannah Arendt dismisses this reference as utter nonsense. If this were true, she writes, revenge would be the cure-all for most of our ills. Against these zero-sum exchange, Judith Butler's analysis centers on the specific context in which Sartre wrote this text, and she writes, Sartre's portrayal of insurgent violence is meant to provide insight into the person who lives under colonial oppression. As such, it serves as a reconstruction of an induced psychological state. It also reads as a fully instrumental rationalization of violence, and thus as a normative claim. Indeed, the violent acts by which decolonization is achieved are also those by which man recreates himself. Sartre is describing a psychopolitical reality, but he's also offering, we might say, a new humanism to confound the old, one that requires, under these social conditions, violence to materialize." End quote. So, Butler's analysis situates Sartre with, within his own existential drama, especially with regards to his self-avowed existential humanism and its normative limits. In this struggle, Sartre's affirmation of the violence of the colonizers is at the same time an affirmation of, as she says, the masculine as the presumptive norm of humanization. It is this gender-biased, humanist normativity bent on violence that Butler primarily objects and proposes instead 
that we see a touch and form of yielding that establishes a relationship to a yield, that is to a pronoun that is open-ended precisely on the question of gender. For Butler, then, this would be a search for an insurrectionary human beyond the constraints of humanism, and indeed an emancipatory quest beyond violence. And she writes, if there is a relationship between this you whom I seek to know, whose gender cannot be determined, whose nationality cannot be presumed, and who compels me to relinquish violence, then this mode of address articulates a wish, not, all, not just for a non-violent future for the human, but for a new conception of the human where some manner of touch, other than violence, is the precondition of the break. So that was presumptive you. <laughs> and he, he is, a is, a, is a you still attained by law, gender roles and other forms of violence. The you whose ways of being in the world invite me to explore the act of touch as an expression of infinite possibilities. The life worlds of Butler's you stand in opposition to those life worlds. The former entail conceptual and effective journeys into the human beyond violence. The latter are the worlds of radical violence that enlivens but ultimately defeats the human. For violence cannot be cured by law. Law can only beget more violence. As such, law cannot be other than violence. But how can non-violence other than violence and other than legal ways to uh, approach conflict and suffering ever be convincing in a world such as ours? Even if it is presumed that global peace, justice, and security are all concepts steeped in violence, literal, symbolic, systemic, can their oppositional pairs, that is, global war, injustice, and insecurity, ever be contained by anything other than sheer force, including the force of law? Writing from Paris the day after the 13th November 2015 terrorist attacks, Judith Butler recalls again the strange metric, metric of grievability that renders some human lives infinitely more grievable than others, and warned that this, the Paris attacks, will take some time to think through. This echoes Zizek's earlier discussed concern with the lure of violence law, with its compulsive urge to intervene, to be drawn in, and in doing so, to succumb to a hypocritical sentiment of moral outrage. This effective response only reinforces the presumed inevitability of violence law. Instead of doing first and thinking later, is there a time to do the opposite? If so, the key question should be, what is it that law violence does to contain and eradicate those most direct and most appalling forms of violence deemed extra legal? When, on 24th August 2015, the Security Council convened its ARIA formula meeting on ISIS and its persecution of LGBT Syrians and Iraqis, it did so apparently to make history. This will be a historic meeting proclaimed US ambassador to the UN, Samantha Power. It will be the first Security Council meeting on LGBT rights. While LGBT rights are no stranger to the international legal system, they have been indeed absent from the Council agenda, not least because at least one of its permanent members, the Russian Federation, opposed their existence to coup. Meanwhile, the Council's dealings with other comparable issues, most notably its agenda on women, peace, and security, have been less than impressive. The agenda that was hoped by some feminists involved in its original drafting to play an important role in disrupting the gender assumptions of collective security response, principally by representing women as vital participants in conflict resolution and peace building, quickly proved to be the very opposite. Four of the six follow-up council resolutions focused solely on women as victims of sexual violence. So what exactly, if anything, was historic about the secretive and informal council's area formula meeting on ISIS and LGBT rights? First, some facts. The meeting was organized by the United States and Chile, whose ambassadors delivered prepared remarks, along with UN Deputy uh, Secretary General uh, Jan Eliasson and International Gay Rights and Human Rights Commission, which was later renamed Outright Action International, Executive Director Jessica Stern. On the, of, of the 15 council, uh, Security Council members, 13 were present and 9 delivered remarks too. Although in attendance, representatives from China, from China, Russia, Nigeria, and Malaysia predictably did not speak. The meeting was addressed by a representative of one Muslim majority country, who, and I quote a uh, report, delivered through generally supportive remarks, a representative of one Muslim human rights organization, and I quote, reaffirming the need to address the abuses committed against all marginalized persons impacted by the conflict, including LGBTI persons, and an anonymous, and I quote again, Iraqi gay man who spoke to the council via telephone. Finally, the council heard Subhi Nahas, and I quote, a gay man from the Syrian city of Idlib 
who received refugee status and now lives in San Francisco. He spoke during the briefing on behalf of the Organization for Refuge, Asylum, and Migration. I have witnessed with my own eyes the annihilation of civility and humanity as I knew them, Nehas told the Council. For millions of Syrians, both in and outside the country, time is running out for my compatriots who do not conform to gender and sexual norms. The 11th hour has already passed. They need your help now. U.S. Ambassador Power, Stern, and Nuts briefed the press later in the day. Stern report, told reporters that ISIS has exec executed at least 13 men charged with sodomy, uh, and it is the obligation of the international community to take action, she concluded. Nahas told the press that he would support international military intervention in order to stop ISIS and end the war in Syria. Thus ended the historic gathering. Its flimsy recognition of LGBTI uh, Syrians and Iraqis as victims of ISIS's rule of terror coincided with a new wave of uh, public executions of those accused of committing the deeds of Lot's people, uh, Amal Khan Lut, uh, that ISIS perpetrated and duly reported in social media. The Arya Formula meeting took place within the context of other such informal and secretive conversations that the Council has recently organized on other atrocious acts committed by ISIS that are seemingly deemed condemnable but sensitive, such as the sexual enslavement of women and girls and ISIS's targeted killing of Christian, Yazidi, Turkic and Kurdish groups. While the Council's resolutions have already affirmed the need to combat terrorism, and they say so, by all means in accordance with international law, its attempt to raise awareness on crimes that ISIS has committed against particular groups based on their ethnic or indeed sexual or gender difference are a tricky business. On the one hand, as evidenced by the silence and one rather lukewarm response of certain state representatives at the area for my meeting of 24 August 2015, recognizing some of these groups' very existence might be a problem for some of the Council's members, let alone condemning such crimes publicly. Such recognition might give those groups a type of presence, indeed a personality in international law and politics, that could later be invoked to condemn violence, both literal and juridical, that many member states happily commit or condone against those or other comparable groups. On the other hand, emphasizing the plights of particular groups, such as these, is seemingly necessary for building a case for the referral of ISIS, ISIS's crimes to the International Criminal Court. But how could ISIS's violence be effectively singled out and juridified, that is, criminalized, without involving other sides to the wars in Syria and Iraq. The International Criminal Court's jurisdiction over ISIS is as problematic as ISIS's stand in international law in general, as an international terrorist organization with an ominous claim to statehood that is both territorial, currently uh, primarily in Iraq and Syria, its most evident physical strongholds, and extraterritorial with its claim to global both real and virtual caliphates. Coupled with most extreme forms of violence, ISIS's personality in international law is perhaps closest to that of the hostis humani gangs, otherwise reserved for pirates in certain rogue states, such as Nazi Germany during the World War II. ISIS's crimes in Syria and Iraq cannot be referred to the International Criminal Court by those states, as they have not verified their own status. But the Security Council could vote a referral of both of these states rather than ISIS specifically as a non-state actor, to the International Criminal Court, as it did with Libya in 2011. However, the likelihood of that happening is slim, since the Rome Statute is designed to prevent one-side referrals. A referral would often open the Syrian regime to prosecution, possibly along with all Syrian rebel forces. This would hardly be welcomed by Russia and China, two of the Council's permanent members, given their support to the Assad regime. As for Iraq, its, its government and the various paramilitary formations would also find themselves prosecutable, something the remaining three permanent member states in the Security Council could find troublesome. With the deadlock in the Council yet again resembling the old Cold War, uh, Cold War fault lines, what little remains other than literal violence of war is to resort to the equally déjà vu rhetoric or rhetoric of compassion and peace building in international relations and law. It is in this role that the Security Council has most readily, it is this role that, that the Security Council has most readily embraced, even if it involves at times sensitive issues such as that of human sexual and gender diversity in most of the majority states. There is, however, nothing historic in its earlier formula meeting on ISIS and LGBT Syrians in Iraqis. 
The meeting conferred but a contextual victim-based recognition upon such individuals, violating at the same time their right to belong to or devise for themselves any other categories of personhood. In doing so, it made the lives of LGBT Syrians and Iraqis temporarily grievable albeit only in as much as this designation could serve a higher legal and moral purpose, the putative robust protection of civility and humanity as we know them, <coughs> i.e. as they are known and protected in international law and as they are to be recognized and protected in the global war on ISIS. That a world war law could be protected by a, a world war against a world enemy is of course not a coincidence. It is the very nature of international law as violence. The very nature of consensus building involved in the difficult task of embedding ISIS into the politically polarized system of international crimes and punishments. Since the juridification of ISIS cannot be achieved without unraveling the threats of international power games, the games in which international law as violence remains deeply invested, the violence of ISIS as opposed to the violence of states or other non-state combatants has to be made special. It has to be recognized as not just malum prohibitum, but malum in se, as with the other hostages to manage and generis, ISIS as evil incarnate invites international law to intervene with extreme violence to kill in order to let live. This is the law as morality, as violence, the law of the peremptory norm, or indeed a commandment that there is something divine or perhaps natural as an existential imperative in exterminating the enemy. But constructing the personality of an archetypal evil requires that an equally exemplary good be summoned too. It is only in the opposite of these legal and moral actants par excellence that violence as law rather than law as violence, or perhaps violence as the law, could ever hope to be cleansed or just, or just The Council's beckoning toward LGBT Syrians and Iraqis and other personalities such as women and girls, Christians and Yazidis, Kurds and Turkmens was no doubt an effort to conjure up the good from across the political divide in order to make the evil of ISIS more palpable, more personal, more punishable. The good are summoned so that evil can be eradicated, so that the violence of such eradication can be done in the name of the good. The LGBT organizations and individuals involved in this purification literal of international law should be aware of the circumstances in which their temporary, <coughs> contingent and informal recognition before the Security Council had become possible. I have argued elsewhere uh, for allegality as an exploratory site of other than life legal life worlds through which the ideological dyad of legal illegal could be effectively challenged. It is perhaps in the same fashion that the problem of law as violence could be productively approached. The events such as the Security Council Area Formula meeting of 24 of August 2015 are not ordinary in as much as they signal the increasing need on part of international law to justify its operations in absolute terms as the battle between good and evil. As ever, the language of the apocalypse is the language of crisis and the crisis currently defaulting international law might be quite existential in nature. It is the crisis of violence feeling everywhere, of violence that no longer seems containable even by most violent acts of law. In it, it is becoming abundantly clear to law's various subjects that law is just violence too. Could such realization lead to an illegal space for critique and contemplation amidst the warring world? Could such a space survive as Zizek and Butler had hoped? The mindless accusations of being seemingly inert cowardly and dispassionate in a time of global crises, each more ominous than the last. If law is abandoned, even if only theoretically, as deep repository of people's identities and hopes that in turn constitute law's subjects, it should be possible to imagine and be in touch with the self and the you in the human who do not confirm, conform to the dominant subjectivities and subjects of international law and legal co-military interventions the constraints of the LGBT identity uh, matrix being here, of course, the case in point. So such illegal selves, corresponding to illegal others, thus living in the void of law, could lead to novel experiences and interpretations of the absence of law's violence. This would require an inverse logic in our approach to the problem of violence, a logic that no longer summons law's violence to tame excessive forms of violence in the world, but seeks instead to abandon law's violence and with it the law as such, 
first and foremost, you know, search for a less violent future. <laughs>
and what that adds or where that is in your paper. I think it, because I guess it takes us back then to subjectivity and think about how subjects are constructed through law. And for me, the relationship between law and violence, and thinking about the gendering of violence in the law, and I guess for me, the gap in law and violence scholarship is it often doesn't talk about power and power structures that are also reproduced through the relationship between law and violence. So I've looked at the gendering of violence in the law and connected to that, both the gendering, but also I think your paper is the heteronormativity of violence in the law. So what does this work do that the Security Council is doing? Does it reinforce the heteronormativity? And I guess that takes you to talk about civilization tropes as well, perhaps. Um, and then Raul, um, at the end of your paper, when you talk about living memory and shame and humiliation, I wonder if you could pick up some of that work. And again, it seemed to resonate with gender politics, but also <coughs> think about how we shift shame um, you know, I guess in stories of atonement, and it brought me back again to Diotto's work and the politics of listening and the work which he did through people's tribunals, and maybe in a way it links <coughs> Valian's kind of questions about how do we have law without violence or, or uh, non-violent law to kind of what you're kind of searching for, you know, what's beyond atonement, what is an effective kind of space here, and I wonder if the model of people's tribunals, which sits in the space of you may speak and we will hear or we will listen, and the kind of post colonial politics that die rights into that, is that where you're going at the end or is that something to be opened up? Uh, so that was my, my specific question. I also wondered if you looked at this way of apology to the indigenous people because its effective resonance was very, it's very different to what the British government has embarked on. <coughs> I wasn't there, and I, and I was ready to be very critical of it. Maybe someone else here was, was in Australia when the apology was issued, but it was seen as an, an amazing kind of mobilising moment that really transformed uh, relationships uh, between different groups in Australia. But maybe other people were there and experienced it differently. But some of the people I spoke to saw it as a very honest and open apology that people really gathered around them. It was quite different to any kind of attempt at atonement. It was simply an apology, and that was what was so effective about it. Um, until seven, I can check if the rooms are free. That's a good idea. But yeah, if you want to open up. Yeah, great. So um, I think what we'll do is take um, a few more questions for all of you, and then I get the respondents each um, some time to respond. Yeah, some time. <laughs> some time. Okay. Um, anyone? I have loads of questions if you do. Yeah, it's fine. Um, Peggy Oliver, who's had a really good one, and had to come to I wanted to try to put Raoul and, and Vanya's remarks into conversation with one another. I am not leaving you out there. But it, it, there seem to be some, some wonderfully um, suggestive connections. Right, so, so if you look at Andrew Sodomy um, here and now, here, here and there, now and then, or um, there, now, here, then, Andy Sodomy laws uh, effectively used instrumentalized law to expose homosexuality. Right. And to subject it to laws on violence, to wreak violence on it. Now we think of the chief function of law in protecting rather than exposing same sex relations right, from um, potential violence. Right. So, so law has shifted from um, homosexuality, exposing to homosexuality, protecting in its function. And I, if, you, if you think about this further, if you, if you, if you, if you, Vanya, your remarks are directed to ISIS. ISIS has its own anti sodomy statute, effectively, right? Since it's prescribed same-sex relations, right? So the, the involvement of, of, of law, or the legal element, or the legal dimension in the execution of gay men, right, is, is, is obvious, but has been neglected in the discourse. So, uh, and, 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 and now you have this, this, this um, scenario whereby the, the, 
homosexuality protection, protecting function of law then serves as the justification for the threat of violence, right? Both uh, effectively, both with respect to cases like Uganda, where there's conditionality, withholding of aid, etc., and with respect to ISIS, where there's a threat of military intervention. for example. Now, in the UK, uh, Pride London, in here in London, is sponsored by Tesla. How? how? So, uh, I'm interested in, uh, as I'm interested in the economic, uh, my question is how How does that work? Um, in, uh, how, how can you work that into your arguments? Uh, for many, I also have a huge question, which is where is the economic in, in your argument that you don't have to answer it in three, two minutes? And for um, well, um, how would would the argument work if there was to be reparation for slavery of some sort? Because we do know that the British government paid out twenty million pounds um, uh, not so long ago, a few years ago, to the to five thousand Kenyans um, who were victims of the Mau uh, massacre. Um, so, and in other countries like in the Netherlands, the campaign to get reparations is still very much ongoing as it uh, has been in Germany. So, um, I was thinking as a lawyer, and I agree completely with uh, Banya that law is violence. Um, I also think immediately as a lawyer that with those other 50, some of the, the persons who are still alive who also may have benefited from a, uh, or may have wanted a pardon um, in the way to go. My immediate thought is, of course, they can choose to turn pardon to to also get that, or to uh, somehow try the decision that uh, something was pardoned that was actually a crime at the time when it was committed, which was something that goes against what um, had, um, what you know is a very uh, normal thing. I mean, that I'd say. Mm. Anyone else for the question? <coughs> Yes, loads. Um, yes, yeah. a question for Rumble about um, it's not people can hear it, and I apologise, but um, I was struck by the presence of World War II in your paper, which I guess is often present when we talk about British national identity in this way. Um, and I just wondered what you thought, and I guess to elaborate on that a little bit, I suppose atonement is obviously set then, but also based on another novel that was published by Bowen in. 1948, but more immediately after World War II, and then of course Turing, and I guess also the fact that um, the apology from Gordon Brown refers to Turing's protection for us to live freely, and in theory that's related to, or on the surface that's about his role in World War II, but actually it seems to be much more about the freedom, as it's another kind of anachronism in which his homosexuality is an argument in itself for freedom, it becomes a symbol of freedom that could be kind of anachronistically applied to the past. And so I just wondered what you thought the relationship was between atonement, which I think you really brilliantly glossed as being this very complex kind of multi-layered thing, and post-colonial melancholia, which is another of these terms that we often do use to describe the complex set of affects in the kind of British national imaginary. So I wondered if you thought there was a relationship, a productive relationship to be drawn between those two kind of affective structures. It was very quick now. The, the point about um, reparations and, and, and broadening the, the apology out beyond Turin is then also a point about the, the continuing um, sex offenders register and, and the fact that some, some people still alive <coughs> who are on, on that register. So it's, it's not just reparations, it, it's the continuing impact of that. Excellent. Okay. So I think we'll start with the uh, so okay, so uh, uh, 
to answer your question, uh, Rahul brought out how capitalism. So when it comes to sponsoring the Tesco, you have to refer to uh, the game. Because that's all you know, capitalism, I guess. But it's very interesting. I want to say something that I thought about it. Because last year, I went to Pride in Brighton. And uh, we had to pay for everything. And it was quite annoying. But then I read, and they wrote, it, it then I was convinced. Because I wrote on the website that they actually ask you to pay. Because, and all the money goes back to Pride. Because I don't let us do commercial sponsorship. And also because there were some times that some homophobic people came into the place where it uh, happened and uh, happened, uh, there was some homophobic violence, so this way it prevented people to come. Uh, so I don't know, so it's very complicated. So, you know, it sounded very convincing when I said maybe instead of bringing Tesco in or taking money from, I don't know, whom, if, uh, you know, not that it excludes people, but then because it's still like 10 pounds or whatever, so it's so very complicated about how, uh, the economy. Uh, so, uh, but, um, and, and, but, it, but so, um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's, for me, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, it comes a little bit into the debate about uh, the BDS, the whole question of the money. People say, we'll work with it, by the government. And I also, actually, but why should that be consideration? Actually, so you are for privatization, so you will come to a private event held in Israel, but not one held in a public university because that's government money, which is my money. So the whole question of public and private money, I think, has to be prioritized more. Because and so that's all I can say about it. I mean, I, I think you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the uh, the LGBT center in Tel Aviv that I said it's run by the government, but on the other hand, I'm kind of happy that I mean it's run by the city. So on one hand, you know, it's problematic. On the other hand, it's nice that the city gives money to you know healthcare for LGBT people. And some will say this center is an example of the neoliberalization. I said not exactly because actually. There's public money involved, so it's much. So I, I think those things are, are much very complicated. And and, uh, and you know where do we take the money to fund those activities? Because uh, as they say, money doesn't grow on trees. So do we take it from Tesco? Do we take it from the government? Do we take it from each of one pays to our own pocket? Or do we take it from our own pocket but based on how much we can pay? Which is so on taxation because actually taking it from the government might be the best because taxation is at least progressive. So, you know, maybe it's better it goes to gay pride than to go to more weapons. But then people say we don't want to go to gay pride because it's funded by the government. So it's pinkwashing. So complicated. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, and to answer uh, Gina's question, uh, um, uh, it, it's, I, I don't think it exists to the same extent as, 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 as uh, governance feminism. As I said, for example, uh, as I said, uh, I, I didn't have time to go into the UN thing, and I knew that uh, Vani would talk about security council, but you can see, for example, uh, you know, obviously, for example, there's no prohibition discrimination of sexual orientation in the human rights, which is unlike sex discrimination, and any attempt to bring it to UN resolution uh, in the past was unsuccessful, it recently has become a little bit more successful, especially, I think, after the change of administration in the US. That was the turning point. But it still gets a lot of backlash, and still a lot of, and, and I think that, Obviously, there is backlash to sex equality, but I don't know that today, uh, I mean, I think that it, it's not the same extent of backlash, and it's still, uh, you know, a, 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 no one can today say deny that equality, uh, sex discrimination is not prohibited in international law, for example. But sexual orientation, it's a question, right? It's not, it's an already a limitation, but then also the backlash, and actually, very interesting thing is in the ICC statute. Uh, because they entered a persecution based on gender as one of the categories of crime against humanity, but then they added that gender would only mean here uh, men and women or something like that. So yeah, so I think there is, it, it, it's a backlash and the, the, the homophobia is still more legitimate than the, let's say, than the discrimination of women. Of course, it exists, but it's, it's still more legitimate. And it's, so I think it's, it's much more in pockets part because of that. I thought it was interesting that Hillary Clinton said that the both are Mm. The image of the Beijing conference with Hillary Clinton mm. there in a pink jacket, and then you use Hillary Clinton as a kind of key kind of global voice speaking out. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a scary kind of similar <laughs> progression going on there. The blue jacket this time. Yeah. Blue jacket for gay rights and pink jacket for women's rights. Blue state. <laughs> Big state. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful question. It's impossible for me to answer this within this limited time, but I will try to very much gloss over some of the main themes here. Gina, thank you, Lisa, exactly, I think. Well, the things that I've been thinking about, not exactly only in this particular context, but throughout, I think, my work, and one of them is always the question of, you know, what is, what is it that is a paragon to something else? That something else, in my work, is always, you know, capital, which we will get later. 
but uh, heteronormativity produces other forms of normativity. The forms of normativity that are, that, are, that are created to oppose it eventually become exactly the same like the heteronormativity, hands, 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 critique, and so on. So it seems that the normativity in the modes of law, right, and in the modes in which law operates, always produces a similar, very similar, actually, kind of violence. And that has to do with the subjectivities that are uh, produced along as well, which is why I'm quite keen on really mentioning uh, in, in, in the context of the UN debate, of the UN Security Council debate, you know, the, 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 the names given to people, maybe against their world, maybe because that's how they call themselves, and not necessarily always the names that people call themselves, but of course it will simplify always this, you know, game until we get exactly the same effect. But it is the effect that inheres in that normativity, it is the very product of it, but all the normativities that are erected against it as well eventually succumb to the, to the, to the same modus operandi. Similarly, with the method, uh, so my last book uh, that, that, is, that is being published, I, I call it Interruption, it's a disruption, but it's, I guess, exactly the same. One of the things that, and in Raoul's work, it, of course, uh, comes out rather beautifully, is, uh, is that time has to be, time has to be disrupted, time has to be interrupted. So if you are talking about this, and I tried in my other work to talk about various histories of, of, of Muslim subjectivities that are sexual and, and generally different, then one of the major things that you will have to intervene into is this linear time that always goes towards this uh, you know, contemporary progression where everything now seems to be you know, directed towards certain global uh, identities. And this is my problem, not just with the LGBTQ, but also with the question of to what extent queer critique has its own limits and has acknowledged them. But that's another talk story. Uh, regarding uh, non-violence, I think it's... Okay. Yeah. All right. Also, Raul has two sentences. Yeah, two sentences. Two sentences. Uh, I can only answer one question, which is, um, this is not a paper about who deserves reparation mm -hmm. and how much and etc. It's more a paper, it's more a paper about affect. What does it say about public culture when some apologies are so easily given without much of a grassroots demand? And other apologies are half-hearted or have to be extracted through legal process such as the Mao case or are not given at all. Mm -hmm.